So today I'm here to uh, talk about OSPOS and also the, the role of inner source that in some OSPOS uh, uh, I have been uh, seeing uh, uh, during the past years and also what inner source can bring to, to emerging open source initiatives and the role that can have. Um, so for this, um, the agenda that I would like to present today, uh, first, uh, since uh, we are in the inner source community, some of them might be uh, familiar to us both, but some of uh, others might not. So uh, to give you a short introduction of OSPO, some OSPO uh, 101 um, uh, key concepts and the evolution of OSPO, like, uh, how it started and, and how they have evolved. Um, also, uh, why is it now considered a worldwide open source best practice and uh, some inner source trends in OSPOS. Um, so to start uh, with the presentation, uh, let's, let's go a step um, uh, further and uh, start with open source. Like uh, right now, open source, it's everywhere. Uh, it has it has won. Like uh, we know, uh, organizations know that it's uh, innovation catalyzers, and a lot of innovation are starting to adopt open source uh, because it has a lot of different benefits. It reduces cost. It increases innovation. And here there are other other uh, benefits that has been proved that works, like accelerates upstream development uh, and more. You can find them in, in the latest report that we did at the Linux Foundation in case you want to, to know more. Uh, so since open source is everywhere, it's uh, actually in 90% of modern applications runs in open source. And organizations need to start taking care of, of, of the open source uh, if they want to innovate and drive digital transformation, uh, some organizations also realize that adopting a strategic posture around open source is no longer optional. So it's not saying that we need open source, our organizations need to um, engage in open source. Uh, it's now time to think about smart open source to start to how to put on a strategy, how to put an alignment and not doing just open source ad hoc, like, oh, there is a vulnerability. How can I, um, in, how can I fix it? Uh, why, why this happened? I don't know. I don't understand how the open source community uh, is because I'm not investing in open source and just using open source ad hoc. So uh, some organizations decided to put a dedicated space, a dedicated team uh, that is an OSPO, an open source program office uh, that acts as this centralized place uh, where all the open source efforts of organization happens. So in other words, is how to put a strategy, how to uh, an alignment in all these open source efforts. So um there is an analogous uh, that some people have been uh, saying lately that is the same way that the chief information security officer role started uh, some time ago uh, when uh, in order to uh, um, to um, engage with all the security incidents and make sure that all the software was secure and OSPO is there to uh, similar role, right? So try to uh, uh, think about all the policies and processes that need to be done uh, in order to engage with open source, how to host open source projects, how to contribute back to the open source communities um, and, and be this centralized place, be this advisor of open source of, of the organization. Uh, you can have you can find the definition in the uh, link I I share uh, below this as well, and uh, the OSPO is it has been two decades old the term uh, already, and it has been uh, it has clear characteristics like 
uh, when people are asking, okay, I understand that it's a centralized place, but what defines an OSPO? Uh, so in a nutshell, it will be these five characteristics. So employees are tasked with fostering and nurturing open source. The organizations has a formal policies and formal uh, processes on how to use and contribute to, to open source. Uh, all the executives recognize open source uh, as an important asset for the organizations and employees in the organization are already contributing to open source. Uh, also, there are different ways to behave. So OSPO uh, has different shapes and different flavors. And um, it depends on why are you creating the OSPO um, different objectives and the different organizations objectives, the OSPO might look different from another different OSPO, another OSPO or even depending on the sector you are based, there are sectors that are quite traditional. So uh, they might be having an OSPO more smaller than other ones that are software companies, they understand the value of open source, like open source flows through their veins and they really understand that so they can invest in a bigger team and so on. And, and the objectives might be different. And also uh, they have different stages, like an OSPO doesn't rise um, eventually and, and now I have an OSPO, but uh, there are even organizations that they don't, at the very beginning, they don't call it an OSPO. They just have one person working even part-time, not full-time. In, in the open source policies and efforts. They have an open source center of excellence. They have different naming. Um, and initially, usually starts in the legal part because it's when the province happens, right? Like I had a vulnerability or I have to build more secure software. How do I do that? And I need to start building processes and uh, be more compliant. And once that is fixed, I can scale and I can start to think about how to build a community, how to get back to the open source ecosystem. So it has its own, they, they have the, in their own stages. And the OSPO level might fluctuate between an OSPO that comes from a really traditional industry or an OSPO that comes from the software sector. Um, but why is it like we, we have seen like the, the shape of the OSPOs and the structure of the OSPOs and what is an OSPO, but why is nowadays considered a worldwide open source best practice? Because this has been here since uh, decades, but it started really small, really niche uh, community in the Bay Area with tech companies. And now we are seeing like uh, the worldwide organ, the, um, the who uh, adopting an OSPO or even uh, the European Commission adopting an OSPO. We are seeing also other organizations, not tech organizations having an OSPO. Why is this happening? Um, so there are certain benefits that an OSPO can bring to organizations uh, that can be uh, summarized in four. Uh, take a deeper look because we will come back when I get into more inner source um, to the culture and the education benefits because uh, as you read through, you will see that it has a lot of values of inner source as well and, and sometimes it has like uh, quite similar um, similarities. So um, OSPOs can help to bridge the cultural gap between the traditional software and uh, the, um, the new requirements for open source development. Um, it can also um, improve um, uh, the tooling and, and uh, create new tooling and modern tooling and streamline this process. Uh, and it can also uh, improve the continuity of uh, open source. Like when organizations really says, let's invest in open source. Uh, sometimes they start uh, with a lot of funding and then they stop because it's, they are doing open source ad hoc, but with a strategy and with an alignment, it's more easier to see the value and uh, 
to put to to align the whole organization to infuse the whole organization of this clear understanding of open source and might um, advance uh, the the open source journey and finally education um, it's about infusing open source uh, of in in the organization as well so all this technical mentorship all this advice in open source and what open source technologies to contribute to and to use is part of all the of the OSPO and of course it's beneficial for for the organization um, and we are also saying that they have benefits and right now it's actually being adopted. Uh, this comes from the last year survey on OSPOS. Uh, just to give you a sneak peek of this in Open Source Summit, we will be presenting the results from the 2022, but these are from 2021. And um, in a nutshell, so, uh, people can see that organizations are increasing in funding of their open source initiatives. Uh, they have some, uh, most of the organizations having an OSPO, 63% uh, have reported that it's extremely critical for the success of engineering. 60% um, of the respondents from this survey said that they were expecting to initiate the process within a year. Um, and uh, we are seeing like established OSPOs highlighted improved code quality as well and more. So we are saying that this is not just beneficial, it's not given like also clear um, benefits uh, to existing OSPOs, but we also seeing that those that doesn't have an OSPO, they're thinking about creating one. And maybe during this year, they already created one. And uh, here you can see uh, all the OSPOs that are in a public way that they were having, that they have an OSPO. You can see a few of them, but also take into account that there are work in progress OSPOs or maybe OSPOs that they don't feel confident enough to say that, hey, we have an OSPO. Maybe they are starting with a small open source initiative. They just wanted not to call it an OSPO and it's fine. But this is a movement that is growing um, each year and it's it's becoming an open source best practices. Uh, some examples of uh, some of the newest OSPOs that happen. So the World Hair Organization launched an OSPO, Porto, Ports also launched its OSPO, the European Commission last year launched its OSPO, and uh, Goldman Sachs, that was a um, um, banking firm and finance firm uh, from really traditional sector also, um, last year initiated its OSPO and they did great job during one year. They accelerated a lot, uh, excelled a lot at their open source contributions and efforts, which was amazing. Um, so let's now move to to the inner source trends and in and what is happening in the Ospovers uh, around inner source. Um, also, I wanted to. This was a panel that was recorded in uh, February or in March for Force Back States. Uh, also, and and we a couple of uh, people from the inner source community, and uh, we were discussing about inner source and OSPOs, and how uh, the differences and the similarities, and also how some OSPOs were adopting inner source practices in there. So, in case you want to deep dive more into into this presentation, I really recommend you to go to part two that will be uh, this panel. It's uh, really insightful. Um, so uh, coming back to the OSPO um, benefits, I wanted to highlight two main, uh, two, two key benefits that was culture and education that, as I said, it was quite similar to some of the inner source benefits that we have been uh, seeing uh, over the past years. Um, and. Uh, it's uh, clear that in some OSPOs, uh, they are implemented in and source pra uh, practices. And we have even added in the OSPO Mindman project, that it's one project that we have under uh, to-do group GitHub repo. Everyone can contribute. 
And um, according to this mind map that was uh, created by uh, the OSPO community and other OSPO and organizations having an OSPO, uh, uh, we established uh, four main responsibilities within the OSPO uh, related with in our source that was um, establish communication channels across the organization, improve collaboration across the organization, uh, remove organizational silos and identify talent across the organization. And, and why this is happening? Uh, because OSPOs are, it, it takes the external side that inner source doesn't have, but also has a lot to deal with the inner part, like what is happening within the organization. Like how, as I said, how can we infuse to the whole organization a clear understanding of open source. And for that, uh, a lot of OSPOs, they have what they call their matrix of experts. So they have their OSPO team, but they are communicating and building bridges uh, with the legal team. They are bridge building bridges with the marketing team, building br bridges with the uh, IT team because they really need to uh, communicate and align with all the different departments within the organization. And here we are not talking about external contributors. We're just talking about the organization because the marketing team needs to know how to uh, interact in inner source communities, as well as the legal team, the legal team that is the first layer when uh, building the OSPO and sometimes this the team that says, no, you cannot do that. How can we do that? It's because they don't have a clear understanding of how to engage with open source. So these open source advisors in the, in the OSPO um, can infuse to them this, this understanding of open source. So as I said in, in the slides, these internal collaborations um, can present in, uh, really great visibility opportunities to the OSPO. And, and that is why a lot of organizations are having this inner source um, responsibility or inner source um, topic within their OSPO. I know other organizations, they have inner source as a separate layer, like they have their OSPO and they have their inner source initiative and they are, um, uh, they are not working together. And there are also others that says, okay, let's start with inner source and then they move to OSPOS. But um, the, the curious part of this, this funny thing of this is that I'm seeing more and more OSPOS uh, trying to um, get this inner source best practices within the OSPO and not outside because they think like this collaboration is beneficial for, for, for both of them. Um, here are some examples of existing open source program offices that um, mention it that they had their inner source um, initiative within their OSPO. For instance, when the who um, created for the first time their open source program offices, they shared their plan and all the different areas of um, um, of focus. So they had legal, they have policy and procurement, technology, te technical, internal culture, and economic and social. And as you can see in internal culture, it's a lot to deal with how can we, how can we um, educate our internal developers, how can we educate the organization into open source. Um, and uh, also in legal, they have some internal best practices. And this comes from Aliander Ospo, an uh, energy uh, firm uh, in uh, North Europe. And they also, uh, within their Ospo, they serve like their Ospo uh, journey. And uh, within this journey, at some point, they launched their Aliander's inner source portal uh, to build, to uh, to build this um, collaboration uh, across teams. Uh, for instance, also SIP uh, in their OSPO, um, they have, well, they, they, they have their all their tasks in, into cluster, divided into clusters. And there is one cluster that is called inner source and communications. And this comes from Comcast open source program offices. 
uh, well, Nitter Rough is not longer um, open source, uh, Comcast open source from Office, it's AWS, but um, when when this report was launched, uh, she was the head of Comcast open source program offices. And uh, she, she, men she mentioned she was the responsible of growing open source culture inside Comcast. So that is also uh, resonates to, to the inner source uh, mission and value. So um, as um, final remarks and as in summary, um, I think OSPOS are a way to bring a strategy to open source efforts, so to, to bring alignment and to accelerate open source adoption, uh, thanks to uh, policies, uh, bringing education to their teams, uh, cultural change, uh, building better infrastructure, being these advisors of open source. Um, I also think that the inner source team or um, an inner source um, um, an inner source um, option can become this expertise team for OSPO education and that they should be working together. They have a lot of resources that they can reuse, like don't create, reuse. There is content out there that were there and uh, the organization can can just adopt it, can take it and, and, and help them to build the OSPO as well. And also, um, well, as I said, OSPO can reuse inner source resources for the practices in order to avoid duplicated effort. Um, and just to answer a story about Tutu Group, um, so we are more than 80 organizations and one more than 1,700 OSPOs that uh, we are working together in the open to drive OSPOs to the next level. Uh, we create guides, we create reports, um, and we create also educational and training programs uh, to, to help this OSPO adoption worldwide. Uh, it's been a while, we were funded in 2012. And uh, since then, we, we have been involved a lot. Um, we started, as I said, a group of organization in the Bay Area, uh, really small because this is where OSPO started. And now uh, we, we have grown the community so long and we keep seeing uh, more OSPOs being created, which is great. So if you are in an OSPO um, and you don't know, you didn't know about Tutu Group really uh, encourage you to, to join the community uh, during the Slack channel and say hi. And about me, um, I was formerly at Viteria, that it's a software development analytics firm focused on uh, giving advice and metrics advice uh, to OSPOs and inner source as well. And, and open source projects. And uh, now I'm the OSPO program manager at Tutu Group. Uh, I previously uh, finished my master's of science in data science, and I'm involved in, open, in other open source communities such as Chaos, um, Devra Collective, or Devra Spain, as well as, of course, Tutu and Inner Source Commons. <laughs>